Hi everyone, this is Alexander Fernandez with Video Games Real Talk. I hope you're having a fantastic day and that things are going well and as expected. We have an amazing guest for you today and which I think is going to be a rip-roaring conversation. Uh, I would like to introduce you all to Sean Layden. Sean, how are you doing today? Hey Alex, we're doing great. How are you? Doing fine, man. Doing fine. I really appreciate you coming on to the show today to, to speak with us in the audience. Uh, I, I really, it's it's been forever, so I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation with you. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 good to be uh, it's good to be chatting with you. It's uh, it's a lovely day here in the Bay Area, and um, uh, let's get this party started. Awesome. So you know, Sean, I know you know you're a man that needs no introduction, but let's let's pretend there are people out in the internet that have never heard or know who you are or what you've done. So can you please introduce yourself? Sure, Alex. Thanks for that. Um, Sean Layden. Uh, my last uh, post was as chairman of PlayStation Studios worldwide for Sony Interactive Entertainment. Uh, that was the culmination of about a 23-year uh, tenure within the PlayStation Group and 32 years with Sony. Uh, about 10, 11 months ago, I decided to uh, to take a sabbatical, to uh, unplug, if you will, uh, after all that time, to uh, refresh, recharge, uh, get ready to go on to the next, the next thing, the next act, um, which turned out to be shelter in place. I think the same next act for all of us. No, absolutely. So, you know, you, you, you were a company man, so to speak, and now you're out in the free in the blue yonder, except for the fact that now we are literally chained to our homes. How have you been handling the pandemic? <laughs> Well, frankly, you know, I got to say, if you're going to be sheltering at home and having various degrees of lockdown, uh, being on sabbatical is not a bad place to be. It's uh, it's by its very nature, uh, self-managing, self-regulating, and um, it allowed me the opportunity to um, delve into some of my hobbies and some of my interests, while at the same time uh, adopting two cats. Yeah, you know, you have these cats. I mean, where'd you get them? So, um, yeah, it was uh, spending all this time uh, at, at home as I am. And, you know, back in my latter days of my PlayStation career, I was on the road like three weeks every month, either flying to Europe or to Asia or someplace in the United States. So uh, my, my home was more of a way station for my luggage than anything else. But now with the, uh, with the sabbatical and with the shelter in place and with everyone staying home, I thought this is a great time for me to finally uh, adopt some uh, furry friends. And I've went online to a thing called petfinder.com, which will hook you up with, uh, with fosters and, and sheltered and rescue animals, uh, looking for, looking for, uh, you know, forever homes. And, um, I found this lovely pair online and they've been with me for about six months. Now. They're very cute. I have to say. So for those of you who are looking for, you know, obviously companionship or moreover, you know, have the heart to take care of animals. We'll go ahead and put a link for, uh, the actual petfinder.com. Yep. Uh, I believe we'll go ahead and put that on there, uh, a link to the show, which is amazing. I mean, I have to say, you know, after effectively 35 years working for place, to, uh, working for Sony, uh, and obviously a, gro a great multitude of that also dedicated to the PlayStation business, you're now uh, back home. What's it like to be home, not being on the road, basically, you know, being the road warrior that you were? How are you finding that? I'm finding it to be, to be honest, it's, it's quite therapeutic. Um you know, when you get into the lifestyle of, of traveling three weeks a month and uh, working uh, 50, 60 hours a week and always being checking your email and uh, uh, and your messages uh, throughout the weekend, uh, you can get to a place where that becomes normal behavior and to detach yourself from that and really have a chance to take stock of uh, what is it that um, I should be doing for myself, for my life, uh, for my family. Uh, and and having the opportunity to, 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 to broadly consider what is my impact on the world and what, what can I do uh, of meaning and significance? You know, having, having some time to, to think about that is, is vitally important. I think we all ended up in that road warrior lifestyle by accident. It is the, uh, you know, the, 20, the 21st century personification of the, the boiling frog phenomenon. You know, we all start working 40 hours a week and, you know, party, get my party on for Saturday and Sunday. And then, that number just racks its up unknowingly. Next thing you know, you're flying to a foreign country on a Saturday so you can land on a Sunday so you can go to the office on a Monday. Um, we really turn our lives into a pretzel without even knowing it. And um, I hope everyone takes a little stock of themselves uh, during this time with the uh, whole world pressed on pause 
to um, to really think about what is it I really want to do or what is it I really should be doing. You know, you you bring something up that I think is really important here. It's that it's just during this great pause, we've all had the opportunity to look in the mirror or in some cases look at the bottle bottom of a bottle and ask yourself a sincere question of where is this going? What am I doing? And, you know, that soul searching that, you know, I'll go out there and call it soul searching because, you know, honestly, what else can you do? It's not like you can drown yourself in computer bits and bites every other minute. I mean, there's a there's a reality where you are at home. You are effectively thinking about where the world is going in your place in the world. And, you know, as you, you've been on your sabbatical here and, you know, you you've been in the game for a long time. I mean, you were basically leading the charge at by far one of the one of if not the leading uh, games company in the world here and i don't think people really understand what it all means to actually work at a breakneck speed and pace that is required in video games because you know when we say video games let's be honest here a lot of people just imagine a bunch of dudes you know coding or doing some art you know they're they they, they don't know about everything that it actually takes to not only develop a product get it to the store shelf, release it, market it, but how to get people's attention. So, you know, I'm curious with, with you now sitting back and you're looking at basically the state of the industry, because I'm sure you're seeing everything. You're seeing the global video games industry as it pertains to how COVID is affecting it. What's going through your mind? What what, what have you noticed? Well, it's a huge question, Alex. And um, yeah, I think one thing I've noticed in, in my chance now to to get out of that kind of the Sony, uh, the Sony bubble that I was in for 30 plus years and really get a chance to speak and meet uh, folks, not only outside of Sony in the game industry, but outside of the game industry in total. Uh, to echo your point, people have a very limited understanding of what it takes to, to run a video game company or what it takes to be successful in the video game industry. Um, many times, I'm sure it's happened to you too, Alex, you know, you're going to a foreign country, you're at the airport, the guy's stamping your passport and goes, so what do you do? What's your job? I said, I work, I work for PlayStation. Oh, really? What, you play games all day? Yeah, yeah, that's what we do. They pay me money to play games all day. Uh, there's, this, there's this idea that video games just sort of appear uh, on, on the shelf without an idea of the, used to be dozens, and now it's hundreds of people involved in the creation of the game. That's not even including the people who have to market it and sell it and ship it and all the other aspects of the industry. But just in the development of the game itself, it's hundreds of people over three to five years and costing sometimes in excess of $150 million. Uh, it's when I talk to people about those parameters on the game industry, it really blows their mind. They just don't see it that way. They can understand why it costs that much money to make a Star Wars movie because they, you know, literally see it all up on the screen. But in the game industry, there's still a feeling that um, it's uh, it's somehow smaller when in fact, as we both know, uh, it's the biggest entertainment industry in the world now. You know, it's funny. One of my favorite things with traveling was always going to the immigration and getting asked, what do you do? And seeing that gleam in the person's eye when I told them that I work in video games. I don't know why. That was the moment for me that always made it worth it because there was someone that, you know, if I was lucky, was near my age or around my age. And I could actually interact with someone who really, truly loves that craft and, and that they, they're they the consumer side of it and they just love it. And so what we do is like mysticism to them. I mean, it's almost like religion. And so there's that moment. I always did enjoy that. Um, you know, but looking at it now, I mean, look at it with COVID. I mean, we look in the news. Uh, this industry, man, you know, I thought the world was over. And next thing I know, the video games industry is just exploding in terms of the best profits, the highest revenues on record. I mean, what do you reckon is the reason this is happening? Well, certainly if you're spending more time at home, you're trying to find more ways to uh, entertain yourself uh, in the home. And of course, video games are a perfect vehicle for that. Um, It has been remarkable how of all the industries out there, this has um, continued to grow despite shelter in place. It's remarkable that the two big platforms, Microsoft and Sony, uh, were able to launch new platforms uh, in a time of shutdown. It's um, it's always been a uh, you know a precept of, of the video game industry that in order to launch a new platform, we need to have demo stations need to be set up at Best Buy and GameStop and Target, and you have to have people get hands-on experience, and you have to have a show where you invite people to come and touch and play it. And now they had to do all of that virtually. 
um, strictly through through the internet. And uh, yet it was one of the largest launches of all time. So I'm incredibly impressed by what both Microsoft and Sony have, have accomplished in, in executing that and very excited to see what this new generation of gaming will bring. And I'm happy to be watching it from the sidelines, to be honest. With you. Yeah, I can imagine that launching a platform cannot be easy. And you've done at least, what, three of them? <laughs> so uh, I think More than that, big... yeah. Oh, okay. How many have you done? Let's see, two, three, four, uh, PSVR, PSP, Vita. Yeah, I don't know, five or six. Okay, so is it fair to say that... Not to mention Pocket Station, <laughs> which no one remembers. Yeah, I didn't even know what that was. What, what Pocket Station? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, this is... Okay, so this is... Okay, so here's the thing. Like, for, for our audience out there that I think is... This is important. So, you know... You spent 20 plus years at PlayStation and PlayStation was launched in, what was it? 1991? Is that, it was 91, wasn't it? Was it 1994? 1994, December 3rd, December 3rd, 1994. Oh One, two, gosh. three, four. Wow. In Japan. In Japan. In Japan. It launched in the West in 1995. But that project started, was it, did it start in 94 as well? Or no, it must've started two years earlier than that, that it was officially launched, right? Yeah. The project started a couple of years in advance of that you know the the origin story for playstation is that it it began life as a peripheral to uh super famicom that um nintendo and sony were going to partner on creating a a optical drive uh storage medium you know using compact disc uh for gaming and um it was just supposed to be a peripheral until nintendo and sony had a parting of the ways as they say before the launch and Sony gave kudragi san the father of PlayStation, the, the green light to take his gaming external disk drive project and write an OS for it and create their own gaming platform. Thus, PlayStation in uh, December of uh, 1994. So let's, let me just, I was 13 when this came out then, looking at it right now. And actually, in fact, I just had a flashback while you were saying this. Actually, that was my seventh grade year. And I remember this very well because my friends had uh, PlayStation 1 appears in the house and we're all playing it. We're all instantly hooked. You know, obviously, thank you for destroying my teenage years. But here I am. <laughs> enhancing, enhancing. Enhancing your teenage enhancing. years. What are you talking right. about? Yeah. What do I, you know, I have a career because of you guys. That's just it. I mean, <laughs> you created this industry, right? Uh, now, what's interesting, the reason why I, I, I'm glad you went back and we looked at this, when you look at what it takes to launch a console, any, any time frame, Forget about now during COVID, it's already difficult. It's a hard thing to do. Is, is that a correct statement? Oh, yeah. It's, it's sui generis. There's nothing else like it in industry um, where you're launching a platform which will then require software to, to, to run on it immediately, even though the developers themselves have only been working on you know, beta versions of dev kit and then more robust versions of dev kit to try to get games to... Um, launch the same day that the platform launches, which is, you know, hitting a bullet with a bullet kind of uh, difficulty. And then at the same time, you have this current generation of hardware with its tens of millions of fans, which you also have to keep engaged and keep happy. And for a period of time, sometimes two, three, four years, you're running both platforms in parallel, uh, trying to um, maximize both of them and keeping all your fans happy as best you can. It's, it's a juggling act like no other. It's, it's certainly, uh, it's difficult. That's why there's not many people doing it or not doing it successfully. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's an exhausting uh, enterprise. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to experience that a half a dozen times. And now I'm, I'm happy to be on the, uh, the fan side of the table. So this show is all about the real talk of the video mm -hmm. games business and what it takes. So with all of your experience and, the multiple platforms that you launched and now looking at where we're at now with COVID full in effect, where do you think the global video games industry is actually going to go? If you were to take out your crystal ball based on your, your, your foresight, what do you think? Well, I think we have a couple of, well, we have, a, we have a multiple number of issues to deal with as the industry matures, as it gets bigger, as it becomes more influential, it's more significant. It's uh, more impactful um, on the business sphere at the, at, at the highest level and certainly in the uh, technology entertainment industries. The challenge of working from home when you're trying to coordinate a team of 
200 people to create a game. I mean, Alex, you're familiar with this. It's, it's gotta be challenging. Uh, I, I, I wasn't there for, for this new challenge of um, uh, coordinating from home, but uh, the people I talked to, I was, I was interested to hear what challenges they faced and then how quickly they overcame them. I mean, one guy was telling me about being in the studio and saying, we get on these Zoom calls and the first question we ask is, who's got the best download speed today? Because you're all at the vagaries of your own ISP, wherever you're living. And some people would be in situations where their ISP just wasn't very good. And they go, okay, you can't, uh, you can't upload source today. Who's, who's got the best connection that can upload the update uh, to, uh, to, to source code back at the studio? Um, that's, that, that's a real world challenge. Uh, not to mention you know, further downstream challenges of how do you then get you know, 150 uh, quality assurance testers all at home to be uh, rigged up to, to test your game and feedback on it. The logistics around that were just enormous. I think the IT teams at, at studios around the world were really pressed into, uh, into overtime and great leap thinking in trying to solve for that. But looking at the launch of both of the new platforms, I think the, ch the developers are more than up to the challenge and managed to uh, manage to solve for that, which is incredibly impressive and could not have been easy. No, definitely it couldn't have been easy. I mean, it's video games is just hard in general, let alone a new platform, let alone during a pandemic. And I, I think this is something that is important for us to cover upon that during this pandemic, it really seems as though the video games industry has come into its own. Mm. I, I almost dare say that we're almost maturing as a medium. And I say dare say because I'm almost cautious to use the word of maturing mm. with the video games <laughs> industry together. But I mean, what do you think? I mean, have we reached maturity as a medium or are we still, I mean, do we got a long way to as go? As a medium, I don't think there's ever maturity. You know, we continue to lay new track and then the road goes on and we pave more and we go further and it extends to infinity. I think as an industry, you could say we're maturing because we're, we've reached critical mass, not only in the number of people involved, but certainly the dollars that, that we're talking about. These are bona fide corporations that are, that are pushing these games through. We talk about the video game industry, and I think a lot of people have a vision of, <laughs> number one, like the guy at the airport thinking, oh, you guys just sit around and play games all day. Yeah, just like the guys at Ben and Jerry's sit around and eat ice cream all day. Um, that's not how it works. But it's not also just an image of you know, people creating games. There's a whole support around it. There's the marketing teams and the sales teams and the logistics teams. Of course, there's huge finance teams involved here. And now with network infrastructure, there's huge networking teams involved. These are massive companies now right across the board, even discounting for the number of people involved in the actual development of the game itself. Just to getting the game to market is a huge industry. And it's, it's bringing more and more people into it all the time. Uh, I think the challenge is of this, this era right now are gonna be around the rising costs of game development. It just continues to cost more and more every generation that you make games. And we're talking about now games cost, maybe on the low end, you, there's, some, there's some indie stuff that's coming in in simple single or double digit millions, but so much of the stuff you would call triple A, or I think one company is now talking about quadruple A because, because inflation. Um, those costs are north of 100 or 150 million. And if they continue to rise at that rate, uh, it's just gonna be very, very hard for people to, for, for companies, certainly the, for chief financial officers, chief executives to green light a price tags like that. And naturally it'll reduce the number of games that can be created at that level, thus sort of diminishing the pool of, of interesting content. and then you get to a lot of uh, redundancy of people saying, oh, that game's popular. Let me make, let me make the same game, but in a different color or, or things like that. And I'm concerned that the market may just become super derivative and not have, um, not have new voices there because they're boxed out by the cost. You know, this cost issue is interesting. I was looking at the price point, $70, $80 a title now which is completely reflective of what you're talking about, increasing budgets and really the almost unquenchable thirst of the consumer for more. How do we get to a point where 
well, to, to your point that, that we don't get a bunch of derivative games or games that are copies of another game just because of the fact that we realize that at an $80 price point, that development budget has already crossed over. Uh, it's north of a hundred million now. What, what do we got to do here? Because I, I mean, I can't, I can't fathom that you can have too many companies being able to make those type of gambles or those type of bets. Well, I think the, the industry, not, not unlike, not unlike the movie industry, frankly, um, has bifurcated. We have this very high level AAA mega blockbuster titles. And then we have a very vibrant indie game, if you will, or smaller range of titles, but there's nothing in the in-between, right? When's the last time you heard someone talk about a double A game? Uh, we've kind of lost what I guess would be analogous in the film industry. We've lost the rom-com genre. <laughs> we've lost that sort of middle piece. And you know, how do we how do we reinvigorate that? Because I think that's an important space where where new concepts and new voices can be heard. We just can't keep hearing from the same people all the time. That's that's going to be the death knell for our industry. We need to continue to get newer voices in the room. I mean, that's why we talk about the importance of uh, diversity at the development level. Uh, it's not just a woke 21st century concept. It really is the idea that if we are going to continue to appeal to a wider audience all the time, we need a wider breadth of talent in the studio helping us create that content which is relevant, which, which speaks to a wider audience. Uh, and that's another way that we can, you know, work on the, the cost angle and, and managing the profitability of games. If we can get more fans, more players uh, in the in the business, uh, and we need to have a wider range of content uh, to attract that uh, greater audience. So you know, you, you touched upon something that I was is really dear to me is the entire concept of diversity in the games industry. Um, I think that is something that honestly is, you know, it is an awoke concept and it, and it does come back down to this idea that if you're going to reach that broader set of consumers, if you're going to expand yourself uh, to reach a, a, a new level of, uh, let's say, uh, consumer penetration, you need to be able to speak to these different people of all walks of life. So on that standpoint, you know, what do you think we need to do? I mean, what advice would you give us in terms of that? How do we reach diversity in the games industry? I mean, is this something that can be pushed from the top down? I mean, how did you see it? I mean, when, why don't we have it? I'm actually even, I'm really, really wondering on that for, for, from your perspective as well, having been in this industry for 20 plus years, you've seen it. I mean, you, I mean, you've lived it. So I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Right. I think if you look back at the, well, some would say the video game industry goes back 50 years. If you, you know, reach back into uh, computer space or some of the uh, early iterations of, of, of gaming via computer. But if you look at just the, the big console industry, it's probably 25 to 30 years old, right? And I think a lot of the talent which came into that industry from the early ages were, how should we say, you know, kids who spent a lot of time with the early computer systems that they had at their school or their, their dad or mother bought for them or they had at home somehow. Uh, the bar, the bar of ent the bar for entry was fairly high because you had to have uh, that technology, that equipment, to to begin to cut your teeth on what programming was like and and how you could create art that worked with your physics engine and made it into a game. Uh, and I think a lot of communities were not able to access that kind of technology, whether it be in their school district or in their home environment. Over time as those systems became more ubiquitous, people became more used to it, um, I think we're starting to see a wider range of people coming into it, but it's still, it's still heavily male, let's be honest. Um, it's heavily male. It's, it's very underrepresented by African-Americans, um, Latinos, uh, women. We need, we need to grow that faster. Does it have to be from the top down? Absolutely. It has to be a value for the company and the studio to realize that um, if we're going to make games for the world, our teams need to look like the world. And if you limit yourself in the people you're going to bring into your development uh, organization, then you will limit the people you're going to be able to appeal to in the, in the world outside, 
with whatever it is you create. So uh, I think there are good business reasons to, uh, to lean into uh, a more diverse development uh, community. Uh, and I think it's just makes, makes for a better work environment in the overall. No, you know, the thing is like, there was a, there's a gentleman by the name of uh, Jerry Lawson that's regarded as one of being one of the fathers of video games, African-American born in Brooklyn in 1940, uh, and effectively is credited for creating the actual cartridge, you know, sw hot swap cartridge. And this is the gentleman who basically shaped, helped shape what we do as a business, yet very few people are aware of him. And I think this is one of those things where going back to the idea that you don't know that you can do something unless you see someone like you doing it. I think role models are extremely important. And this is something that when I look at uh, the leadership in, in companies around the video games industry, and I mean, I've said this before, and I mean, I'm actually I, right now, I've not seen any other Hispanic CEOs in the video games industry, which has been kind of shocking for me. Uh, at the same time, I'm looking around saying, I know I'm not the only person who probably has that someone from a diverse background who looks at this, uh, you know, you yourself as a, an executive working at the companies you've been a part of, uh, how, how do you think it is for individuals to come up within organizations let's say large corporations? What is it that you think they would need to do in order to get, what advice would you have for them to say, Hey, listen, to get up into those high powered ranks, what is it they should be looking for? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny you should say it that way, Alex, because when I began my career with Sony in 1987, uh, I was hired by Sony Tokyo. I was living in California at the time, but I went through an application process and got an acceptance into Sony headquarters in Tokyo, Japan. And when I got there, I realized at the time we didn't have this phraseology, but looking back at it from a 21st century vantage, uh, I was a diversity hire. I was brought into Sony Corporation back in 87 when they had their internationalization scheme, meaning to say they want to make the company more international in its employees because they're an international company. So I was one of probably at the time, I guess, maybe a dozen or 20 uh, non-Japanese hired into the Tokyo headquarters of Sony to help them with their internationalization. And I was, you know, 20 something at the time. and got a job at the headquarters of Sony and immediately put in charge of managing and uh, relating or working together with the foreign press in Japan, like the bureau chief of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or the Economist, or the Financial Times. Uh, I was in the communications department, so PR was my job. And I was brought in to work with all these other foreigners who were coming into Japan from the media. So I do feel in my bones what it's like to be the only the only american in the room with a bunch of japanese executives um it has a downside because of course you are a, a minority amongst a much larger majority but at the same time it has some upsides because i got into meetings or rooms where a 20 something japanese wouldn't get into simply because i was the english-speaking white guy from california uh and I was able then to, to see various aspects of the company to, to understand what contributions I could make, the things I could do that no one else could do. I think that's the part about when, you, when you're joining a group which is largely populated by people who aren't like you or don't look like you, is to a certain degree, you wanna fit in, you wanna become part of that crowd, but don't forget that there's a secret sauce that you bring. There's something that is completely unique to you that if you don't use that and leverage that, for me, it was experience of living in the West and uh, speaking English uh, and being able to understand and uh, relate to all of these other foreign executives or, or, or foreign media people uh, in Japan. My ability to do that, I wanted to lean into that to, uh, to show the unique qualities that I could bring. So being trying to work your way into the crowd is, is, is a natural drive of, of humans to be part of that part of the tribe, but um, don't forget your unique skills because that's that's what will set you apart and then set you above. You know, it's at the time that you know, as you were talking, I was just imagining a twenty-something-year-old American going to Japan, uh, <laughs> the heyday of the Japanese oh. economy. Uh, what was that like? You know, can you give us a taste? You know, I mean, you got, you got, yeah. What was that like? I mean, honestly, this is this is the '80s in Tokyo. 
So give us a little color. What what was it like? It was crazy on? is what it was like. Um, back then in the 80s, coming through college, you know, everyone was reading books like Theory Z and uh, The Miracle of the Japanese Economy and guys like Bill Ouchi and Clyde Prestowitz and all these names that you don't hear much about now were writing books about the miracle of the Japanese economy and, and how they had um, cracked the nut on, you know, good corporate balance and, and, and business acumen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, property prices were skyrocketing in Japan. They had a huge real estate bubble. Uh, there was conspicuous consumption everywhere. I remember restaurants were serving bowls of udon, but you could get it with gold flakes on top because there was just so much money going around. They didn't know what to do with it. I remember going out at night and between midnight and three in the morning, you could not find a taxi in Tokyo because everyone was taking the taxis and going home because they had a bunch of money and why, why take a subway train? Uh, and waiting until three o'clock in the morning to finally get a taxi to pick you up. Those were crazy times. You know, people were uh, spending like, uh, like madmen. I remember even Sony Corp. I was there when the company bought CBS records. Now, they bought CBS Records in 1988, I think it was. Um, but it wasn't so much of, a, of an acquisition because they already, already had the CBS-Sony joint venture in Japan since the early 60s. So the word was out on the street that CBS was starting to sell, sell off its record division. So Sony bought CBS Records almost as a defense for their Japanese. You know, you, have, you own half of CBS-Sony. You don't want to wake up the next day and find out you're owning now half of uh, Philips-Sony records or something like that. So they bought CBS records in order to protect their Japan interests and to lean a bit more heavily into the, into the music industry. And then in 1989, the company bought Columbia Pictures, which was seen as um, a huge step by a Japanese company to buy an American icon, as they say. At the time, it was even on the cover of Newsweek magazine. They had the, the Columbia icon female uh, you know, logo, logo person wrapped in a kimono. And I think the tagline was Sony buys the soul of America. Uh, I remember one reporter went to talk to the founder of Sony, Akio Morita, and asked him, Morita-san, what do you say when you're accused of buying the soul of America? What do you say when people accuse you Japanese of doing that? And Morita-san was very clear with his answer. Like, well, if you don't want us to buy it, why do you put it on sale? And... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and he was right. You know, there's 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 nothing nefarious about Japanese buying American companies more so than Americans buying German companies or vice versa. It's just it's just a commercial activity. Uh, but it was a time when everyone was afraid that, or worried, shall we say, maybe not afraid, but but concerned that that Japanese industry was just going to take over the world. People really worried about that in the '80s, and then the economy blew up in the 90s. Isn't that kind of funny how that seems to be a worry that people are having with China? I mean, that seems to be, we literally, it feels like we're just like history repeating. Uh, different country, same fears. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you, you brought something there to the table that you, 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 you know, I don't know if many people know this, but uh, you, you were working with Marita San. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what lessons did you learn by effectively working with the founder of Sony, what was that like? And, you know, it, tidbits, because I mean, this is something where for, I mean, literally, this is talking about the, a person who has touched pretty much every person's life and the video game industry, let alone the electronic industry, let alone anyone who has a television or has ever listened to music on a portable device. I mean, Sony is ubiquitous and you worked with the man who made this all happen. So uh, can you share a little bit, you know, and plus you were you know, very young man at that time. I mean, in your tw late twenties and early thirties. So uh, please, <laughs> what was it like, sir? Ah, uh, it was, uh, it was the most remarkable ride of my life. I'd been with the company in Tokyo for about three years working in the communications department. And during that time, of course, when you're, uh, the communications department and companies is a very interesting place to begin one's career because it puts you in kind of a crow's nest over the entire organization. And you get to see all that's going on because you have to know everything that's going on because you're gonna to talk to journalists later and explain what's going on. It also gets you into rooms that you typically would not get into if you were in another department or in a different position. 
and it gives you exposure, sometimes good, sometimes bad, uh, to the uh, to the upper echelon of executives in a company because you need to you need to escort them and 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 work with them and sit by when they have interviews and just like Secret Service, when the questions get too hot, you've got to jump in front of the bullet and take one for the team. So I had the opportunity to, to interact with, uh, interact. I got the opportunity to work for Moritzan a number of times in my communications role, just by being there when like David Sanger, who was the New York Times bureau chief in Tokyo at the time, would come to interview Moritzan and I would go and arrange the interview and sit with David and, and Moritzan and they talk about uh, Sony and the Japanese economy, et cetera. We did a whole thing with Diane Sawyer and 60 Minutes uh, with Moi Desan, uh, set that up and spent uh, 10 days in Japan with Diane Sawyer and her crew shooting uh, shooting those interviews. Uh, it was it was magical. It was like nothing you could ever think of coming out of college. Like, I want to go get a job where I go spend 10 days with Diane Sawyer and shoot a documentary for 60 Minutes. But you just kind of wake up one day and you find out that's what you've got to do and you get up and you go do it. Uh, so Moitasan knew me from those experiences. And then in 1990, after three years in the company, his chief of staff came down to my department and said, Moitasan's looking for a, uh, needs a new speechwriter. And he's seen some of your writing and he thinks you'd be good for the job. And, uh, would you take it? And I remember at the time thinking, is this really a question? Is this is this is is there a no option here? And in fact, my boss in the PR department, when I told him about it, uh, he was adamant in saying, "Don't, don't, just say no, just say no. You'll work eight days a week and you know twenty five hours a day, and they'll wipe you out." And I thought about that. I thought, yeah, that's probably true. The times that I worked with him on like the sixty minutes piece, those were eighty hour weeks getting that thing done. Uh, but at the same time, I looked into myself and said. If I don't take this offer, I don't want five years from now to keep thinking about what my life has been like had I taken that. I didn't want to have any regrets around it. So I think if there's anything, any through line to my career is that almost every time someone's asked me, would I do a thing or take a job or help with a project? I, I always defaulted to yes. Um, if I really knew that I could do something to help out, that I could actually be additive to, to the mix. Uh, saying yes is powerful agency in oneself. And it helps you forestall later on regretting, you know, what, why didn't I say yes to that thing there? Now, granted, a number of times I've said later about something I've decided to say yes on, is like, why the hell did I say yes to this? Uh, and then you have to find a way to extricate yourself from those situations. It's easier to get out of something that you may have rashly jumped into than it is to deal with mystery and regret later for not having said yes to something. Does that make any sense? No, it, it actually really does. And I think this is something that when we talk about really for diverse talent, getting up into the up, upper echelons of companies and up and into the higher ranks, I think you, what you just shared really just with your own career is, is really timely advice that I think people should really meld together. Cause in the end of the day, you need to say yes. Finding ways to take those opportunities that take you somewhere that you didn't think about maybe puts you in an uncomfortable situation, but it opens doors that maybe you never knew were possible. You know, Marita Sun is a, as an entrepreneur and really as one of the best business people in the world. I mean, I think pretty much he's one of the commanding heights of business, especially for uh, Japanese business. You know, having that opportunity to see how the man worked and, and how he thought is there anything that you would say, like, you know, you would tell other entrepreneurs or, you know, even someone like myself who runs a business, is there anything that you think, like, you know, I saw this man do this, this is something that I would tell to you or anyone else that was listening that could be helpful for them? Wow. I mean, there's just so much there. He, he built that company out of nothing in the rubble of post-war Japan, together with Masaru Ibuka, who was more, more of the technically inclined and even though Moitasan was, as he would call himself, a physicist because he had a degree in physics, he was really more of the business and marketing mind, you know, to be honest. There were, there was a, one thing that Moitasan said early on, and I think a lot of people have, he either got this from somebody else or, 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 or people have invoked his, his thoughts later on, is that um, 
when you're making a product or you're having a service and it's successful, you are obligated to obsolete it yourself. If you can make obsolete a verb, to make obsolete the thing you have created, you know, to murder your darlings. Because if you don't, someone else will, and you will be left. You'll, you'll be left behind. So he was constantly iterating on products that were already successful to make them even better or bigger or getting out of business lines and moving into new things. Uh, he was always saying yes to, uh, to new innovations and new opportunities. Uh, he had an insatiable curiosity. Uh, he knew more about classical music than most people I, I, I've met in music. Uh, he had a love for film and for uh, uh, not so much television. But, but certainly uh, a huge a huge love for film and, and music uh, and technology. Uh, he, he also had an amazing ability to communicate. Uh, one thing he also said to me when he was giving a speech was that, you know, Sean, if you're, if you're talking to people and you think they're not understanding you or what the point you're trying to make is, do understand that's on you. That's on the speaker. That's not on the audience. And he would always use a, a, a like electronics meme around that. So it's like their TV only gets channel four and you're broadcasting on channel seven. You know, they only get channel four. So why the hell are you broadcasting on channel seven? You know, it's on you, the speaker, to take that to them and, and deliver it up. Uh, as a speech writer, I was with him all the time, writing for him all the time. And on one trip we had, we spent 30 days in the United States in, in a private jet flying all over the country, delivering speeches at at company events and at uh, you know Japan American Chamber of Commerce type things or the Toronto Commission meeting places like that. We were in San Antonio, Texas, and Sony had just bought the uh, I think it was the Fairchild Semiconductor Factory. It might have been Texas Instruments, and made it a Sony Semiconductor Fab in San Antonio. And they asked more to some, "Would you speak to the Would you speak to the employees in the lunchroom?" And he said, "Of course, I'd be happy to." And I turned to more to some, I said, "More to some." This wasn't on the schedule. I don't have a, a text for, for a speech at the factory. Um, I can try to put something together. And he looked at me kind of bemusedly and said, Sean, if you need to write a script to talk to your own employees, you're doing it wrong. And I said, OK, OK. And he got up in that lunchroom. We only asked the guy, how much time do I have? And the guy says, 15 minutes. And he started his story, began with an anecdote, created an arc about the company and what the company wishes to do and why we're here in San Antonio and came back to the original anecdote, tied it off with a bow, like 14 minutes, 30 seconds. Wow. And the whole time in English, which is his second language. So he really had an ability to connect with people and to communicate and to, to share with them his thoughts and his dreams. And I think the employees at, the, at Sony really felt um, felt like they were they were in it together with Moita Sun on the business they were doing. He wasn't sat above them. He was sat with them. That's incredible, man. I mean, just thinking about that, I mean, there's so many gems of wisdom in this, especially the entire concept of creative destruction, but you being the force that destroys your own business by reinventing itself and reestablishing it or establishing new new lines. <laughs> You know, we always talk about there being a th almost a theoretical limit to the number of boxes that can be installed in someone's home, right? There's seemingly that 200 million number is always the number we're trying to surpass. Uh, if you if you were to look at the industry now, how do you think we reach the next 2 billion gamers? How can we as an industry reach that next level that we've never seen before as an industry? How do you think we do it? You, know, you raise you raise a good point, Alex. That you know throughout the console generations, um, and we're either at generation five or nine, depending on how you count them. Uh, it does seem to be an aggregate cap, somewhere between two hundred and three hundred million, that um, any particular generation can only install those many pieces of hardware. And I think the peak of that was when the Wii came out, because a lot of people thought they could lose weight, and they bought it as an exercise device. So. They kind of branched out into a different market, uh, which over time didn't sustain, but it was it was a good effort. But to your point, yes, we do seem to have this this cap that we can't reach. We can't reach the penetration of toaster ovens, let alone televisions. Um, 
with game consoles yet and how do we get there? That's been a huge question that the industry has been wrestling with. And now on top of that, if we're looking at games costing more money to make and thereby possibly costing more money to buy, uh, the fear is then that actually, instead of growing that, that, uh, that number, we could end up shrinking it by pricing people out of the marketplace or pricing ideas out of the development space. So we have to confront that. I think it goes back to our earlier conversation about we need more voices in the room. We need voices on content creation and the way we express that through, through gaming. At the same time, I think we need some more ideas in the room to tackle the issues of what kind of tools can we create? What sort of technology can we leverage that will help us contain the manufacturing, uh, the, the development costs of these games? So many games continue to, you know, reinvent engines and code, which, you know, as they improve and iterate over time, of course, that's a benefit, that's a plus. But at the same time, you know, games keep recreating geometry uh, and worlds and, and uh, uh, environments over and over and over again, which come at a great cost. And is there not some way that we can, we can either automate that or you know, create vast libraries of, of geometry that we can then pull from without having to recreate it every time? The, uh, the, the ingenuity of the engineers, we've really got to hope for a breakthrough to bring down just the sheer cost. And cost is really a function of time because every dollar spent on a game is really spent on people who are making it, which is, which is fine and good. Um, it's just taking them longer and taking more of them to get the thing done. So how can we, how can we manage that better? I think a lot of companies have tried to do outsourcing to lower cost of living countries around the world in order to, to mitigate that. But that is only a temporary salve. And, and over time, as you know, countries prosper, all those costs continue to rise. Um, and so that can't be seen as a long-term solution to, to this problem. Um, but um, yeah, not, 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 not to prowl on too, too long on this one, but we have to find ways, whether it's through tools or other kinds of ingenuity, um, procedural generation of, of cities or that type of thing to help manage the sheer volume of effort required to make a game and at the same time bring more varied voices into the room so we continue to make different games that may appeal to an audience that, uh, that otherwise weren't interested in uh, epic space opera dramas or post-apocalyptic survival horror games. So then to our audience out there of developers who are listening here, hearing you, what you're saying, what do you think they should be spending their time on then? You know, if they're, they're looking at this world of $80 price games, you know, hundred million dollar budgets. And they're like, well, that's great. I'm, I'm indie or, you know, I, I can, I can afford to make a, a single a game, which right now just to kind of give you an idea of what I've been hearing a single A game is running running around five to six million. A double A game is being priced at twenty, and I'm like, wow, this is. I mean, I remember when twenty million was triple A. Uh, so th things have completely changed. So you're hearing these developers now; they're out there and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, I don't even know what I'm going to do here. Uh, wh what would you give them? What advice do you have for them? Where should they put their time? <laughs> You remember when 20 million was triple A? I remember when 20 million was just outrageous and you couldn't even think of that number. <laughs> so those were the uh, days. <laughs> those were the days. Core bit of it, whether you're a game developer or a movie writer or a songwriter, uh, what is it you have to say? What does you have to express? What is, what is your driving motivation to enter into this? creative process of entertainment. What are you trying to accomplish? And to understand that well, and to then ask yourself the question, am I bring, bringing something new? Am I doing something that's going to be seen as unique? If the answer is no, and if you're just going to try to leverage 
uh, topically popular subject matter or game mechanic because someone else is doing it, making a lot of money doing it. Um, I mean, that's that's a way to run a business. You can you can definitely do it do it that way, but I I don't think it overall adds to the breadth of offering in in in, in the entertainment world, and certainly in video gaming. What what can you bring that's new and different? And again, I I say it again, we have to start looking at different cohorts and different collections of team members. When I was at PlayStation, we were just starting to do a lot of work with developers in Latin America and South America to see what the voices could bring down there. And, and there were completely different views on, on gaming concepts and a bit probably simplistic or naive executions of the ideas. But the kernels of a lot of them were very, very good. And maybe they just needed a bit more polish or a bit more technology to help them really expand and blow out. But, but there's going to be a wave of, of content coming from, from South America, I believe. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be very impactful on, on the gaming business over time. Uh, and yourself, Alex, you know, you've, you've got the bird's, bird's eye view on what's happening in the, in the Southeast Asian markets and the development communities and the growth of that there. Um, Malaysia's become an ever bigger player in, in video gaming. A lot of them starting off as outsource houses and then now turning into original content creators. Um, I think those are very exciting developments as well. So can we, can we come to an agreement then that we need to get more people into this business and we have to find ways to attract them into it. And at the same time, we have to put our, our big thinking caps on to see how do we make the creative process more accessible, how more people can come into people go into gaming, go, oh, I don't program and I don't do CGI, so there's not a role for me here. That's not true anymore. I mean, those roles are central and core to game development, but we're spending a lot more time with the narrative process now, the creation of the story, and how do we express that story uh, in an interactive context. And we need to find more original stories out there instead of repeating ourselves again and again. No, I, I completely agree with you. Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Africa, the next 2 billion gamers, their voices, their ideas, their thoughts, I think are going to absolutely revolutionize the video games industry. Uh, and it will happen as long as we also have people within the large corporations and decision makers also filled with people from those backgrounds. It is the only way we can get in there or else we will can constantly be fighting this hurdle uh, that we have fought for, well, I don't even know, for the past 30 years uh, where we don't necessarily hear from them. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering, Sean, if you, you know, obviously there are parents out in the crowd that are hearing their children say, I want to make video games for a living. Video games is a job. Mom, dad, I'm going to make video games. You know, forget going to Harvard. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make video games, you know, uh, you know, honestly. You've been in the business, sir. What, what advice do you have for people with kids that want to get in games? Is this a job or is this just some, you know, waste of time? What would you tell them? <laughs> I would tell them that the video game industry, you know, in America alone, it's, it's what, a $45 billion industry? Or 50, let's call it a $50 billion industry. Uh, it has roles for people everywhere from the game development end of the business, all through the publishing that we talked about before. I think any parent should be delighted if their child wants to be part of an enormous industry that is growing and leans heavily into, uh, into technology and into, uh, into creative pursuits. I think that's a, that's a wonderful place to, um, to see, to see, to see your children uh, express themselves. I mean, uh, my son works for a video game company, not surprisingly. Uh, so that's uh, the, the the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, in the development field specifically, I think it's I think it's wonderful that more children uh, get introduced to uh, coding at a younger age. Um, 
I remember when we've had our first computer when I was in junior high school. This was like 1973 or 74. Uh, a PDP-8 uh, terminal on a uh, uh, on a timeshare with the uh, local school district, and I was one of the like eight kids who were in the computer science club that was newly minted back there in the early 70s. Um, and I'm sure my parents thought it was, a, was not a good use of my time. Um, but I think we've we've gone past some of those prejudices, some of those biases, some of those. Um, uh, now, now we are surely in the age of revenge of the nerds, uh, and I think parents should 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 encourage their kids to to pursue that. If, if nothing else, you know, the great thing about games, which is which is why I I've, I've always been very supportive for children who you know from you know try try to tell parents don't don't worry too much about your kids playing games. Um, it's much better than just sitting back and watching TV, right? Sitting back watch TV and let let TV happen to you. Uh, games at its at its core is about problem solving. That's all it is. You know, how do I get from this place to that place? What what do I need to collect in order to achieve this this goal? How do I finish this level? And when I fail to either finish or defeat the boss, I take that, I learn from that, and I do it again, and I do it again until I achieve the right result. Uh, it really engages the player. You know, we talk about the lean in experience rather than the lean back experience. And I tell parents, you know, this is teaching your child how to solve problems. It's teaching your child that failure isn't deadly. You can go back and try again. So your children increase their risk tolerance on things they're willing to try to do. I see so many positives in the gaming experience that um, I would be happy to discuss that with uh, uh, with any parent who's, who would be overly concerned or, or have a negative feeling towards their children pursuing a career in that, uh, in that industry. No, I think you, you nailed it on the fact that the problem solving that you learn, the grit that you learn, almost the like a, like a good platformer trying to jump and land on that platform as it keeps moving, you keep doing that over and over until you figure out how, and, and it does teach you to take risk. You know, when you look at uh, the finance industry and their, their obsession now with the video games industry, uh, it's no surprise. Uh, our industry has grown so fast and it's matured so quickly on a global basis. We're at $172 billion a forecasted reach 200 billion by 2023. Nothing is the rocket ship of the video games industry, yet at the same time, traditionally, we have had the hardest time attracting external financing until the pandemic. And now the industry is awash with cash. So you have funds, you have banks, you have family offices, private investors all coming in. And I'm sure you're seeing this too. So do you think video games is the right place to put money? And if you do, or if you don't, why not? And of course, what would you tell our moneyed class that has now entered this space? How can they partake in, uh, I guess, monopoly? <laughs> I was at an offsite um, uh, in the uh, <clears throat> in the months before before the, before the pandemic, and it was an offsite um, with a bunch of investors and politician types and industry types all kind of come together to chat and drink wine and, and talk about stuff. And I remember talking to uh, a group of investors there and about my experience with, with the video game industry and kind of probing with these folks, you know, why would you not want to invest in, in, in video games? Or why would you invest in, you know, like WeWork, for example? And one of the answers I got was one I, I typically get from folks outside the business looking in are that, well, you know, video games, it's really a hit driven business and you know, it's difficult for us to predict what's going to be a hit. And, you know, um, so content is tough because of that, that hit thing. But I look at it and go, what business isn't hit driven, right? You say games or, or content are all hit driven. What about the automobile industry, right? Uh, Lexus, it's a hit. Um, you know, American Motors, not so much. Uh, 
every every industry is driven by hits. You just call it differently. In the video game industry, I think, is difficult for folks uh, to invest in or has been until until the current situation because it's just very opaque. It's hard to know how it gets done. You know, money goes in here, game comes out there. What happened in the in-between? Um, how come how come every game slips? Uh, that's been something I've been struggling with for, for many, many years. Uh, all the release dates move in only one direction. Uh, and these are things I think make, make investors skittish. So on the video game side of things, I think we need to get better about uh, development scheduling, about really how long it's going to take to get this thing done. What are we going to spend to do that? Um, typically, in my experience, the final budget money spent on a game was rarely, rarely equivalent to what was projected as the cost at the green light meeting, you know, years, years before the final, uh, the final delivery. Uh, so the game industry needs to get better in, in how it expresses and forecasts um, its costs around development, how much time it's going to take. Because again, cost is just a function of time because it's all based on salaries. Uh, and they have to find ways to talk to the moneyed classes. Uh, to help them understand that better. And uh, I think a lot of the investors would rather have investments where they, I put money in now and you know, what's my nine month, what's my 18 month, what's my 24 month burnout. And with so many games, it's like, um, put money in now, we'll come ask for more money later. And any dollar you see is probably four to five years away. I get it, that's, that's a hard one to get their heads around. But um, to your point, Alex, I think pandemic has shown the resiliency of this industry. In fact, its ability to to perform against calamity uh, in the marketplace, and so more money will be coming in. I think I think now is now is the time uh, for um, aspiring developers to work on their pitch decks and try to make the contacts necessary to uh, to see if they can get some financial backing behind the projects. Because as you say, there's money out there now. You know, I think that that that. It sums it up. I mean, the reality is the money is out there. And what's crazy is that the money is there, but the know-how, the experience, the work in the trenches is very hard to find. And so, you know, that brings me to my next question. For, for someone with such experience as you have, with your years in the business, what do you do next? What's next for Sean Layden? Where do you go? That's such a good question. Um, and I've been... I've been spending a lot of time recently just getting stock of my life and what's important to me and about what I would like to do uh, in the next in the next bit of my bit of my career. I'm I'm on sabbatical. I choose that term deliberately because I'm not retired. Uh, the whole planet's on pause, and so am I. And the planet will come out of pause, and so will I. And we'll go into into the next thing. I'm not sure, Alex, to be honest, you know, I love the video game industry, but I also love the idea of taking, taking the three, let's call them the three, TV and film, music, gaming, these three entertainment spheres, which already create kind of a Venn diagram uh, where they all overlap in different places. Uh, I think those three circles will become less trifurcated, if you will, and that Venn diagram will start to resemble a concentric circle, perhaps, and finding ways that all these forms of entertainment can come together uh, in something that's even more magical than what we have right now. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I think there's some hurdles to be, to be, to be vaulted. Virtual reality is going to come into its own in the coming years, and that'll be an interesting way to find expression for that. I think VR has a lot of potential, if for no other reason that once you're in a virtual reality experience, you start to you start to believe it, you start to become it. You you really are in that environment, and it, it strikes you in a in a very profound way. I think one of the things that's also sort of off-putting for our industry vis-a-vis -vis those who are not gamers is just the whole idea of the controller. The controller is really, I mean, you you and I see it as just, yeah, you pick that up, you play the game, and, that, and there you go. If you've never played a game before, looking at that controller can be quite intimidating. 
I mean, just just think back on, <laughs> just think back on all the all the catalog advertisements for big box retailers where they have some model in there holding the controller the wrong way. Yeah, I remember those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember them. You can probably still see them if you look for them now. So I know, absolutely. Yeah, you're like, you know, they're like, Let, let's let's hold this as though we don't know what it is because they don't know what it is. And so, you know, once we can find a way to eliminate the controller from the gaming experience, then you get more people into it. I think that's why, you know, touchscreen gaming um, on mobile phones is so easy for people to pick up uh, because they have a screen, they have a finger, and they know how that works. Uh, in VR as well, as you have better cameras that can do finger tracking and hand tracking to a, a higher degree of accuracy, then you begin to lose the concept of the controller, which I think um, would be a true breakthrough for, for gaming uh, as far as getting more 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 people to, to, to walk into the idea. So where do I sit in all that? Um, I sit in a space where if there's something meaningful I can do to start to bring those varying media streams together from film and television and music and, and gaming um, into a into that juicy center of the Venn diagram, um, that could be interesting. I have no doubt that your phone is ringing. How can people get a hold of you if they want to reach out? What's your Twitter? I mean, what's the best way for them to ping you? You can find me on Twitter at, at Sean Layden, and you can find me on LinkedIn uh, under the same name. Um, those are places where uh, people have reached out to me and uh, uh, with with ideas, with uh, uh, with inv invitations to um, jump on some grand adventures with them. Uh, I've not taken up any of those yet. I'm still uh, enjoying my sabbatical, enjoying my cats. I think it's very hard to get a new thing off the ground virtually, but the more and more we look at it, it seems like 2021 is going to look a lot like 2020. So much as I would rather group together with a new team to, to fight a new battle uh, uh, in, in a face-to-face in -face sort of real way, um, I'm thinking we'll probably have to start getting used to launching all these things off of a, off a 2D Zoom call. But uh, yeah, LinkedIn and, uh, and, and Twitter is where, I'm, where I can be found. You know, Sean, this has been uh, such an enjoyable uh, conversation. And, you know, we're definitely going to have to have you back on the show again to, to go more deep into a variety of different topics. I mean, we, we have such a good conversation that, you know, obviously your wealth of experience and knowledge and, and just overall experience is something that our, our listeners uh, definitely enjoy and, and love to hear more about. Uh, is there anything else that you would love to, uh, I guess you could say, bestow upon everyone here or let them know? Anything else that you feel like saying uh, before we sign off? Well, I'll just say this. Um, to all gamers out there and all fans of the business or the industry, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank you for your support, uh, to encourage you to continue to Continue to engage with the gaming industry. Uh, let your favorite developers know how much you love them. Um, let the developers who somehow disappoint you, uh, let them know in a very constructive way how they might um, uh, lessen their disappointment, uh, lessen their disappointment to you uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, but be part of it, uh, be in it. Uh, continue to, uh, to interact and engage. That's, that's why we love the gaming community. Um, no community is more dedicated to the industry that it loves, um, but it can also be a very harsh mistress if you get on the wrong side of it. But I think that's all fair. Let's, let's, all, let's all realize that the, the, the development community is trying to bring its best game forward for all of you to enjoy. And, and we know that um, if we get it right, you will you will you will be happy for it. So I just like to say that, and I'd also like to say to to all to all of the listeners out there that um, these are very trying times. This is like nothing you've ever experienced before. This whole idea of pandemic, this whole um, working from home, sheltering in place. Don't lose hope. We will get through this. 
because that's what we do. And um, if gaming can be part of that solace or that suspension of, of disbelief, um, please continue to engage. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. Well, everyone, this comes to an end of this episode of Video Games Real Talk with Alexander Fernandez. Thank you all for listening. And if you want to follow us, please go ahead and hit us up on Twitter at StarveUp. And of course, you can go to the StarveUp uh, website, www.starveup.com. Uh, we'll be coming back at you. And we thank Sean Layden again for his time. And of course, for all of your time for participating and listening to us. And we'll see you guys on the next one.